welcome to Health Live at Seniors today. We are delighted to have here with us Dr. Lancelot Pinto, a leading respirologist. Dr. Pinto is with the PD Hinduja National Hospital and Medical Research Center in Mumbai, which is there in two locations in Mumbai, Thar as well as Mahim. He was a gold medal recipient at the DNB examinations in respiratory diseases in 2009 and trained at the McGill University at Montreal in Canada from 2010 to 2014, during which he completed a master's degree in epidemiology and clinical fellowships in sleep medicine and COBD re rehabilitation. His main areas of interest, including management of, uh, of severe COPD, drug resistant TB, smoking cessation therapy, and the management of sleeping disorders. We are delighted to have you here with us, Dr. Pinto, and uh, uh, would love to have you address questions and speak on uh, the, the topic for today being better sleep for better health of senior citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Pradyuman, for inviting me and thank you, seniors, today for having me here today. I will just share my screen. So I will be speaking on better sleep for better health and, and uh, it is deliberate that I have not used the word seniors anywhere or senior citizens anywhere uh, because the principles for sleep remain constant whether you are young or old. People assume a lot of things about the elderly. People assume that sleep patterns get shorter and you know elderly individuals tend to need far less sleep, but uh, a lot of that is not really true. So the principles remain constant, which is why the topic is better sleep for better health. So why do we sleep? So somebody uh, humorously once said that the only known function of sleep was to cure sleepiness. And this was, this was reasonably true till about a century ago, but people didn't really know what function did sleep serve. But then in the 1960s, especially at the University of Chicago, which led the way uh, in those days, a lot of research started being done in, in the context of sleep, in the context of trying to understand why we slept. So there was a, a famous experiment called the Tetris experiment. So Tetris is this game where you have blocks which are falling down and you have to arrange them in a line. And it takes, it takes some spatial understanding. It takes quick reflexes to make things work. Uh, and they did an experiment where half of the individuals, uh, everybody was shown the game and taught the game and how to play the game. And half of the individuals then slept over it. Uh, and half of the individuals were sleep deprived. They found that individuals who had slept for six hours or more after learning a new task improved while those who didn't uh, did not, suggesting that sleep played some sort of a role in, in finesse, in improving your understanding of things, improving your, your skills at doing a certain task. There was uh, this other bunch of experiments, which were math experiments done at the University of Lübeck in Germany in 2004, uh, where individuals were given a certain problem. It was a certain math problem. And the math problem had two ways of solving it. There was a complicated way and there was a shortcut. There was a simple way. They allowed half of the individuals to sleep well at night and half of the individuals did not sleep well. Uh, and they saw that when individuals returned to the problems, the problem later on, those who had slept were twice as likely to find the shortcut than those who didn't, uh, suggesting that even when it came to analysis, even when it came to understanding things better, sleep played a very important role. There is something called the glymphatic system in the brain. So just as you have toxins which accumulate in the body, which are cleared out by the lymphatic system in the body, there's a similar system in the brain. And whenever the brain works throughout the day, whenever there's intense thinking, memory formation, et cetera, uh, some of these toxins are generated in the brain and these toxins tend to be cleared out at night. So there's a glymphatic system which, which works on full drive at night, clearing out the brain, refreshing the brain. And what has been found is that in certain new neurodegenerative diseases, such as Alzheimer's, uh, the, the, the stuff that accumulates in the brain could very well be the stuff that is normally cleared out at night during sleep. So a lack of sleep has the potential uh, of causing accumulation of these substances. There is a strong association between depression and insomnia as well. And it's a, it's a chicken and egg situation. We don't know whether depressed individuals tend to sleep less or whether the lack of sleep causes individuals to become depressed, suggesting that there is a role in homeostasis there as well. So what happens when one doesn't sleep? So this was another famous experiment where they took uh, a bunch of mice. These mice were kept in a chamber like this. So the mouse is right at the center of the chamber. If it falls asleep, it falls into water. So it wakes up again, it has to jump up again, stay there. Pretty inhumane if you ask me, I guess PETA would not be happy about such experiments today. But what did they find? They found that th in 32 days, so 32 days over which they conducted this experiment, all the rats that were involved in this experiment died. 
What about humans? So the similar experiments were conducted at Guantanamo Bay, right? Where you had individuals who for the purposes of torture, for the purpose of interrogation were sleep deprived. Uh, and they studied this and they found that there were subtle hormonal changes, cortisol, which is a stress hormone, thyroid hormones increase. And there's a rise in blood pressure if you don't sleep adequately. Individuals tend to crave carbohydrates a lot. A body's temperature falls down. Immune responses become suppressed, thereby predisposing you to infectious processes. And simple cognitive tasks become challenging. So even doing things like addition, subtraction, simple math uh, becomes difficult. And they do, they've, they've done experiments where they look at reaction time. So when you look at a light flicker on the screen and you have to press a button, your reaction time significantly slows down when you are sleep deprived. And this has a very important role when it comes to say traffic accidents, you know, the, your reaction time is very short. And if you are sleep deprived, you are more likely to have a problem. In the US, vehicular accidents caused by drowsy driving exceed those caused by alcohol and drugs combined. So people think that it's alcohol which kills people on the road. People think that it's drugs which kill people on the road, but very often sleep deprivation uh, can cause more accidents. So it's about one accident per hour uh, is, a, is a consequence of sleep deprivation. The next question therefore is okay, we know that sleep is important for health, we know that it's important for cognition, we know that it's important for understanding, memory formation, calculation, thought, etc. But how much sleep is enough? So looking at chronobiology, so basically the, these are experiments which are conducted where you take, a, take people, put them in dark caves, have them live in those dark caves without any cues of light and darkness, and see naturally how much that they are, how much does their body allow them to sleep or make them sleep. And it has been found that most individuals would need about seven to nine hours of sleep. So that's the, the average. So the bare minimum recommendation across the world for most individuals is about eight hours. So if you sleep eight hours, it is still possible that you need more because some individuals need nine. Uh, but if you sleep less than eight hours, it's very, very likely that you're not getting enough sleep. There are circadian rhythms uh, which are there in the body. So there is a light and a darkness pattern. There's a body clock which works at different times. Uh, and if you look at circadian rhythms, so some people say that I work best in the morning. Some people say I work best at night. So these are the traditional people who we call as owls and larks. So the owls stay awake all night. The larks wake up early in the morning. And unfortunately, the way our lives are designed, whether it comes to work, whether it comes to school, whether it comes to social lives, Everything works on a principle of wake up early, early to bed and early to rise is what we tell individuals. Whereas that may not be true for everybody. Some individuals perform better the other way. And these individuals tend to struggle with sleep. So if you're a night person and you have to fit into a schedule where you have to sleep at say 10 in the night and wake up at six in the morning, such individuals struggle a lot. And this is about 40% of the population. So it's not a small number. This has implications for individuals with who, who travel a lot, for example, jet lag is a problem that in, that all of us have faced at some point of time, uh, simply because our biological clock goes out of sync. Individuals who work in shifts find it very challenging as well. Now, what happens is we live in an age with a lot of backlit devices. All of us have iPads, all of us sit on computers, on laptops, on, on cell phones. And this, these backlit devices give our brain a lot of light. So our brain, so we have a small little gland at the back of our brain called the pineal gland. And this gland converts light into trying to figure out whether it's day or night. And it secretes melatonin accordingly. So if it's night, melatonin gets secreted. Melatonin kind of helps you transition to darkness. But if we expose the brain to tremendous amounts of light, which is what most of us do nowadays with, with backlit devices, uh, the brain gets confused. The brain thinks that it's still daytime. Uh, and therefore, individuals then struggle to fall asleep. So backlit devices are a very important cause of insomnia. They're a very important cause of contributing to individuals struggling to sleep. And we'll talk about sleep hygiene and how that can be, uh, how that can be helped. What are the sleep changes as one ages? So everybody assumes that the elderly need a fewer hours of sleep, but that's not really true. What does happen is that as you grow older, you tend to get tired earlier in the afternoon. So you, you know, normally people would stretch out their day till six and seven, and that's when fatigue sets in. But as you grow older, you tend to fatigue earlier, and then you wake up earlier in the morning. So this is called a phase shift. So your biological clock moves in such a way uh, that for some reason you wake up earlier in the morning and you feel sleepy earlier in the day. That does not mean that you need a lesser number of a shorter quantum of sleep. You still need your, your, your minimum eight hours of sleep. 
It's just maybe that the pat pattern shifts. So DIM stands for difficulty initiating and maintaining sleep. So people who are elderly sometimes struggle to fall asleep. And if they do fall asleep, there are frequent interruptions and we'll talk about why that happens. Uh, the elderly tend to have lesser REM sleep. So the deeper, the deeper parts of sleep tend to be lesser, which is why you tend to be a lighter sleeper. So any sounds, any noises, any sudden bright lights will wake you up a lot easier uh, because you tend to spend more time in the lighter forms of sleep. There's also more daytime somnolence, so daytime sleepiness, uh, which very often is a consequence of this fragmented sleep, this sleep which is not uh, optimal. About 25% of older adults tend to nap during the day, and this, this figure tends to be a lot smaller for young adults, unless you are in regions of the world where siestas are considered to be normal. Uh, but if you're not in those regions, most, most young individuals, it would be about 8% of, seven to 8% of young individuals who would try and nap in the day, uh, as opposed to 25% among those who are older. There's also a huge difficulty adapting to disruption. So if, if as you grow older, your capacity to do all nighters. So an older individual say there's a marriage in the family and has to stay awake all night or to stay awake till late will take a much longer time to recover from that kind of a disruption uh, than a younger person, uh, which is why having a schedule becomes more and more important as, as you grow older compared to someone who's young who can pull an all nighter and then go to work the next morning. What are the uh, other changes that happen? You must remember that older individuals who don't sleep well are more likely uh, to suffer from depression. So this is a very important point that, that I'd like to raise. So I have a lot of patients, a lot of people come to me saying that we are, we are finding it difficult to sleep. And this insomnia, nine out of 10 times is a symptom, it's not the disease. So it's, you know, the knee jerk reaction for most people would be to prescribe you a sedative, say that, oh, you have difficulty falling asleep, we'll give you something to fix the difficulty falling asleep. That does not tend to be a good approach. If the difficulty falling asleep, if the insomnia is a symptom, for example, if you are very depressed, if there has been a major life event, you, you've just passed your retirement age and you've been, uh, you've moved from a working life to a retired life. If your children have just left and, and, and gone abroad for studies, for example, if there has been some major life event which triggered off the insomnia, it's very likely that that trigger or the depression associated with that trigger is the real problem and the insomnia is just a manifestation. So trying to fix that, trying to do a quick fix there with sleeping pills is something that I would strongly advise against. Individuals who don't sleep well, adults who don't sleep well tend to have attention and memory problems. They tend to be excessively sleepy during the daytime. This is very, very important is that you tend to have more nighttime falls. So one of the common problems that we see among the elderly who come to a hospital are falls, right? So individuals who fall, who have fractures as a result of the fall, and then unfortunately remain bed bound for a long time as a consequence of those fractures. And, and that very often can be a changing, a changing event in one's life. So a person who's very active till that point of time suddenly starts becoming a little more dependent and, and that can lead to a cascade of, of things that are not desirable. So it's, it's very important also therefore to sleep, to make sure that you are alert, that you have a lesser frequency of nighttime falls, et cetera. Um, Insufficient sleep can also lead to problems such as heart disease, diabetes, weight problems, and it's been associated with breast cancer in women. So insomnia, lower quantum of sleep, sleep-related problems are associated uh, with heart disease and, and with, with cancers as well. So suggesting that sleep plays such an important role. Now, what are the common sleep problems in the elderly? So if you have joint pains and if you have osteoarthritis, for example, or if you have rheumatoid arthritis, you know, your joints ache then that pain can sometimes interfere with sleep. If you have pain from any other cause as well, uh, it, it could interfere with your sleep. A lot of adults, especially men, have prostate issues when they grow older. And uh, as a result of which there's frequent awakenings during the night to pass urine. Uh, and that can disrupt sleep, that can interfere. So people go to the washroom to pass urine. When they come back, they really struggle to fall back asleep again. Insomnia is a common problem. And again, I would like to remind you that very often it's a symptom, not the disease. You must also look at the medications that you're on. There are a lot of blood pressure drugs. There are heart, heart, drugs for heart disease. Uh, there are other drugs that you could be on for chronic conditions, which could interfere with sleep. So if you're struggling to fall asleep, also make sure that you go through the list of medications that you are on. Maybe do it yourself. Try and see what the side effect profile of each of the drugs is. And if, if those drugs have been reported, 
uh, to cause insomnia and you are experiencing it, maybe ask your doctor if that can be switched, whether that drug can be swapped for another drug. Daytime sleepiness is again a very common problem. Again, arising from the fact that a lot of individuals uh, as they grow older don't sleep enough at night. And because they don't sleep enough, they tend to be sleepy. Sleep apnea, I've highlighted it in, the, in bold because it's, it's a serious problem. It's a very common problem that gets often unrecognized and underdiagnosed. And I'll be having a few slides just about sleep apnea. Restless leg syndrome is a syndrome in which individuals have this desire to move their legs constantly. It tends to happen at the end of the day where you have to constantly shake your legs, move your legs, have somebody press your legs. And then when you go into bed, uh, that irritability in your legs uh, interferes with your sleep. It doesn't allow you to fall asleep. Uh, spouses or partners of people with restless leg syndrome will often say that the bed sheets are all over the place. The person is almost kicking them through the night. Um, and there are certain causes for restless leg syndrome which need to be looked at and potentially can be worked on. REM sleep behavior disorder is where individuals act out their dreams. So they're in deeper parts of their sleep, but they start moving their limbs, often hurt themselves while doing that, flail their limbs against a wall or you know, get injured actually in the process. And, and this can be one of the symptoms of Parkinson's, of early Parkinson's disease. So it's something that you don't ignore. So if a person is acting out their dreams and seems to be uh, moving a lot, almost injuring themselves during their dreams, you should see a neurologist at some point of time or a sleep expert. How do you ask yourself, how do you know whether you're, sleep, whether you're, whether you're a sleepy person? So there's a simple questionnaire. Uh, this presentation is going to be up so you can come back again online and have a look at this. There's a simple questionnaire that you can fill up to know whether you are a sleepy person. You just put down a number against what is the probability of you sleeping in different situations. You add up the number uh, and you see if you tend to be a sleepy person. And if you are a very sleepy person, uh, I suggest that it's something that you don't ignore. Try and find out why are you sleepy. Now let's move on to obstructive sleep apnea. It's one of the commonest diseases this, that we as sleep, sleep experts treat. So what is OSA? Basically, this part of our windpipe, the part here, uh, is a floppy tube. It's a tube which does not have any bones around it. It's a tube that doesn't have much cartilage around it. So because it is floppy, it, it easily collapses. So when you go to sleep at night, when you sleep flat, your body has this, your body goes into a state of paralysis, right? Your body becomes floppy. So it's very tempting for the windpipe at this stage also to go floppy. And the brain has to work very hard to keep that windpipe open. Uh, the brain does that through inputs to certain muscles, which are called dilator muscles, which open the windpipe. But if there is a lot of fat around the neck, if a person tends to be obese, certain people who have small chins and very square faces, uh, the windpipe struggles to stay open. Now, when the windpipe struggles to stay open, uh, a sound is produced during breathing. So when we normally talk, uh, when we normally breathe, we don't produce any sound from the windpipe. But when the windpipe is partially shut, the vibration of the windpipe causes the sound of snoring. Uh, and when you snore, if your oxygen levels dip because you aren't getting enough air, that is what sleep apnea is all about. It's the commonest sleep disorder. Its prevalence is about 5 to 10% among middle-aged men, lesser than premenopausal women. So, so the, the prevalence in men tends to be much higher than that in women before women hit menopause. The moment women hit menopause, certain hormones which are protective are no longer there and women also tend to gradually have the same rates of sleep apnea uh, as men. So this is what I was just describing. This is the collapsible segment of, of the windpipe. It's almost like the fat around and the muscle around the windpipe is the sealed box around it. And whether or not air moves through this windpipe depends on the pressure on the windpipe, which tends to be worse when you're lying flat. So when you lie flat, gravity is against you. If you have a lot of fat around the neck, if you tend to be an obese person, the gravity tries to shut down the windpipe uh, and the counter forces aren't strong enough to prevent that. And that, that essentially is what sleep apnea is all about. What are the signs and symptoms? So you have daytime sy symptoms. Basically what sleep apnea does is twofold. Number one, it reduces your oxygen throughout the night and that can lead to high blood pressure, that can lead to heart disease. The second thing that it does is that it fragments your sleep. So when your oxygen levels go down, your brain at a subconscious level wakes you up. And when you wake up, the oxygen level comes up again, then you go to sleep, it goes down again. And this tends to lead to very fragmented sleep. It tends to lead to sleep, which is not of a good quality. As a result of which, people with sleep apnea tend to be very sleepy during the day, tend to be depressed, tend to be irritable, lack energy. They wake up feeling completely unrefreshed. 
there's a problem with concentration, problem with memory. And as you grow older, when your brain gets a little more labile, it gets a little more sensitive uh, to, to these effects. Individuals with sleep apnea can have serious memory problems because of the lack of, of good quality sleep at night. How, do, how does a spouse, how does a partner, it's usually the partner who diagnoses sleep apnea. A person who snores very often will not know themselves that they snore or not. It's usually the partner who will notice loud snoring, will notice that a person snores and stops breathing sometimes. So those are called apneas when there's complete stoppage of breathing. The person may wake up sometimes choking at night. That, that's a symptom as well. Uh, passing urine frequently in, at night is also a symptom of sleep apnea if there is uh, no other reason for, for passing. So if it's not a prostate problem, if there's no other obvious reason, sleep apnea is something that you should think of. It also leads to sexual dysfunction, cardiac arrhythmias, night sweat sometimes. People sweat a lot at night. So these are some of the signs and symptoms to watch out for. But the number one symptom is snoring and loud snoring, uh, which is often noticed by the partner. It's not noticed by the person himself or herself. If you are overweight, if you smoke, if there's a family history of sleep apnea, so people whose parents snore are more likely to snore themselves, that's because your faces resemble your parents. The genetics of obesity also generally tends to run in families. Uh, males tend to have more sleep apnea, especially when younger. Uh, as you grow older, the, the, the probability of having sleep apnea increases simply because the muscles get more and more lax as you get older. Alcohol and sedative use worsen sleep apnea. So people who have sleep apnea, their partners will notice that on the nights they have alcohol, the, the snoring tends to be much louder. And the, the person himself or herself feels a lot more sleepier the next morning because the sleep apnea gets uh, of an increased severity on the night after consuming alcohol. This is a quick way in which to try and ask yourself whether you have sleep apnea. If you snore loudly, if you are tired and fatigued at all times, if you have observed apneas, which means that your partner or somebody watching you has said that they've seen you stop breathing at night, and if your blood pressure is high, if you have two or more of these, you are high probability sleep apnea. If your body mass index is more than 35 kg per meter square, if you are over 50, your neck girth is more than 30. And if you are a male, if you have three or more of these, again, you, your, your probability of sleep apnea is high. One of the common things that I tell my patients is if, especially if you're a male, if you cannot put the top collar button of your shirt, uh, there's a very high probability of you having sleep apnea. This is how we diagnose sleep apnea. We do something called a sleep study. So if you see there are a few sensors, uh, people always ask me, do you end up sleeping if you have so many things attached to you? And the answer is yes. Very often because people having the sleep study are very sleepy individuals. Uh, this is how we monitor oxygen. We monitor airflow throughout the night and figure out whether the airflow ceases and the oxygen levels drop during the course of the night. So this is how we sleep, uh, treat sleep apnea. This was the first paper that was published in 1981, which looked at the treatment of sleep apnea. So if you look at the figure up, the swings that are going up and down, these are oxygen levels, which are fluctuating throughout the night. You put the person on what we call a CPAP and the oxygen levels completely stab stabilize throughout the course of the night. So what is CPAP? This is what CPAP looks like. It's a small little machine with a mask. All that the machine does is it blows air under a little bit of pressure. So this is not, um, this is not oxygen, this is not humidified air, this is just regular air, but blown under a little bit of pressure. And the pressure of the air is what opens up the windpipe. So the analogy I give is it's like a cheap straw. If you take a cheap straw and you suck into it, the straw collapses. If you blow into it, it opens up and that's all we're doing uh, with CPAP devices. It has the potential to dramatically change your life. And we especially see this in individuals who are very sleepy. So if you have sleep apnea and you tend to be a very sleepy person, uh, consolidating your sleep by using a CPAP machine can dramatically improve the quality of your sleep and improve the quality uh, of your daytime because you aren't sleepy anymore. I'm going to go through a few quick slides on sleep hygiene. This is what's recommended for everyone. It's not necessarily for somebody who's elderly, but more so for someone who's elderly. Try and maintain a constant sleep schedule. So shifting your sleep schedules often is not a good idea. If you do have caffeine or nicotine, so if you smoke or if you have cig uh, if you uh, if you smoke cigarettes or if you have coffee or tea or anything that has caffeine, so even colas, even things like coke has ca caffeine in it. If you do have to have something with caffeine, try and have, try and have it before two in the afternoon. So the later, as you grow older, your body's capacity to metabolize caffeine decreases significantly. So after about two o'clock in the afternoon, I would strongly uh, recommend you avoiding any caffeine. 
if you do uh, exercise is great people who exercise tend, tend to sleep better than people who don't exercise but try and do the exercise in the first half of the day because exercise again can stimulate a person can make a person quite bright and hyper uh, and that can mess up sleep as well alcohol and food should ideally be terminated about 2 hours before you go to bed so if you sleep and you eat till the point of time you go to bed and you go to bed immediately your body processes that are digesting the food are going to keep you awake because there is stuff going on in your body if you have alcohol right up to the point you go to sleep you may transition into sleep better so alcohol is good to help you fall asleep but alcohol is terrible to keep you asleep so most people who consume large quantities of alcohol will tell you this that you you, you fall asleep wonderfully uh, but you wake up the next day feeling as if you haven't slept at all because your sleep tends to be a lot more fragmented if you do have to nap try and nap before 3 try and keep the nap as short as possible so 15 to 30 minutes is is okay the longer it, the nap the lesser the likelihood that you will fall asleep nicely at night so if you take longer naps you're going to struggle and it becomes a vicious cycle of it becomes like a chicken and egg vicious cycle so the first thing i tell people who are struggling with sleep is absolutely try and abandon the nap if you can't abandon it then get it down to at least 15 minutes or so and not more than that a hot bath before sleep helps because it helps regulate your body temperature uh having a uh, feeling lowering your body temperature so when the external environment is hot the body temperature lowers a little bit and that kind of helps with sleep avoid lights and backlit devices so i strongly advise you to get rid of a television in your bedroom if you have a bad television in your bedroom uh it shouldn't be there try and avoid taking your cell phones laptops ipads um, into your bedroom keep them out and go to sleep in your bedroom and it will change the quality of your sleep expose yourself to bright sunlight in the morning because that again resets the body clock it tells the body clock that this is bright light this is morning now that was about sleep hygiene how to improve your sleep quality what about sleep safety i think it's always a good idea to keep a telephone within hands reach uh, for anybody who's elderly always have a quick dial on that phone which you can you know a one touch dial which will take you to somebody you love somebody who can come uh, immediately if you need any help switch off notifications so if you don't know how to do this ask somebody to help you out but try and switch off all your notifications at at night so if you have facebook if you have twitter if you have things going on in the background con- constantly uh flashing that bright light is going to interfere with your sleep whether you realize it or not so switch off all notifications during the night make sure that a light is within reach so you need to be able to switch on the light if you need to use the washroom try and have a night light if it's possible so that you don't trip or anything lights with motion sensors especially for hallways are a great idea so that again you're not finding your way in the dark uh, never smoke in bed i think this is common sense for everybody if you have rugs cords stools and furniture all over your bedroom try and make sure that they are completely out of your way especially if you're going to the washroom so between you and the washroom make sure that there are no cords there are no rugs there's nothing that you can slip on slide on so summarizing sleep plays a very vital role in health not only in physical health we know it's associated with heart disease with with uh, with psychiatric illnesses but also with behavioral health both the quality and quantity are useful so you need a minimum of 8 hours but those 8 hours also need to be good quality so if you have a disease like sleep apnea please get it addressed sleep on it is important from a mental perspective if you have a problem sleep on it you'll wake up with a solution because sleep consolidates memory and don't lose sleep over it uh is also a great piece of advice so don't be so stressed out don't be anxious about things that you lose sleep over it because that's counterproductive do remember that there are a lot of accidents which are associated with the lack of sleep accidents within the home accidents outside the home a uh, screen and test for sleep apnea it's by far the commonest condition that we see when it comes to sleep problems especially if you are high risk you must screen yourself uh and those are the questionnaires that we put up if you want you know self evaluate yourself with those questionnaires ask your spouse ask your loved one ask your partner if you snore loudly at night uh and don't forget simple measures of sleep hygiene and safety so simple things like keeping a regular schedule simple things like avoiding caffeine simple things like are avoiding backlit lights light can make a huge difference uh to to sleep hygiene as well as safety thank you we have quite a few questions that have come in already and sure. um, i know uh, get into them right away so there's a question from uh, someone an anonymous attendee who says i'm 70 years old and have very disturbed sleep i get up two or three times a night to go to the toilet and toss around for an hour before i go back to sleep i do not take any sleeping pill 
So right. So so the first question is uh, why do you need to go to the to the washroom twice or thrice a night? And you know things like diabetes, for example, if your sugars are high, that could cause this nocturia. Uh, if you have prostate issues, that could cause a problem. Uh, if you have sleep apnea, so there are there are mechanisms by which sleep apnea leads to what we call diuresis, the production of a lot of urine. Uh, once we address these questions, and and you know if you find pathology somewhere there, there's something abnormal, then those I think addressing those problems should be a priority, and the sleep will automatically uh, readjust, because it's pretty much you know just like he's asking the question, he's saying that it is that disruption in sleep which is causing a problem. So we need to figure out why that disruption is actually happening. Uh, there's another question from a 69 year old who says my wife passed away recently due to COVID. And I'm unable to get sleep sometimes, even after taking a sleeping pill. We're still 50. I keep imagining my wife walking around the house. What should I do? So this is clearly grief, which is manifesting as, as insomnia, as, as difficulty falling asleep. Uh, I would strongly uh, dissuade somebody like this from taking sleeping pills. And I would encourage them to seek counseling in some form. Uh, so I think a professional counselor can do wonders in terms of trying to readapt, trying to adjust. There may be support groups out there for survivors of individuals who've, who've gone through it. Uh, and I think this is this is part of the natural grieving process. And I, I don't think it should be medicated with medications. I don't think that's a simple solution. Thank you. We have a question from uh, Suhas. And you know he sent his report also to you. Um, so he's, uh, uh, which, which I had forward you. My father has been diagnosed with grade one mild obstructive sleep apnea. What should be the future course of action? He has been prescribed a capsule inhaler and nasal spray. Any lifestyle changes will help uh, uh, to get this issue resolved, he asks. So again, the context is very important, you know. So so it's it's not just the severity of sleep apnea. So somebody with mild sleep apnea, but who has you know high blood pressure, who has heart disease, etc. I would treat more aggressively with somebody who has mild sleep apnea and has nothing else going on. So if it's just mild sleep apnea, I would say try and reduce some weight, try and exercise a little more, uh, you know, improve your, try and sleep on your side, for example. If you, sleep apnea tends to be a lot better on your side versus your back. So just the act of forcing yourself to sleep on your side can make a big difference. We, we tell individuals to sew tennis balls into their t-shirt so that the tennis balls are on the back. So the moment they go on their back, it becomes uncomfortable, you go onto your side. So a lot, lot of things can be done to treat the mild sleep apnea, provided uh, you know that's the context, that it's just a sleep apnea and there's nothing else going on. Now, if the sleep apnea is thought of as being contributory uh, to a lot of other diseases, then you would probably want to be a little more aggressive. The other big question is, did the person actually sleep well on the night of the study? So if the person say didn't sleep well on the night of the study, studies can often underestimate the severity of sleep apnea. So I think, I think the context is very important. It's not just a study that you're looking at. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have a question from uh, from uh, Nita Parekh who says, I do regular yoga and I'm fresh in five hours. Is that okay? I'm 60 years old. It's just moving away from this, but I thought I'd ask you this. Anyway. No, I think that's a great question. This question of, you know, is, is uh, so when we talk about everything in science, everything in, in medicine, we talk about the average and you know there are outliers on either side so if you are an outlier and five hours is good enough you feel absolutely fresh you don't have to take 20 cups of coffee during the day to stay awake uh, then i don't see a strong reason to force yourself to sleep longer but if you know you you are surviving on five hours in which you are struggling to keep up with it and you know you say i'm i'm okay you know I'm, then then there's a problem but when we talk about an average of eight, we know that there are some individuals who are as low as five. There are some individuals who are as high as 11, for example, who need 11 hours of sleep. So I, I think if you if you don't have any problems in the sense that if you're quite fresh, you're quite awake, you're quite alert, uh, and you don't have any major comorbidities, you know, which could be attributed to a lack of sleep, I don't think you need to fix something that, that, that seems to be working well. Uh, we have a question from Rajpal Singh, who says I'm 81. I get dreams almost every night. Due to this, I do not get sound sleep. What would be the cause for this and what is the remedy? And uh, he also says, does sleeping during the day make, uh, uh, make for the deficiency of sleep at night? Does it make good, the deficiency of sleep at night? 
so that's again a very good question and and uh, people have looked at this whether you know this is what we call a sleep debt where you don't get enough at night and then you cover it up over the weekend or you cover it up during the day so a lot of uh, so when it comes to a lot of young people who are sleep deprived through the week and sleep for extended amounts during the weekend it's clearly been shown that that's not good that's not physiological that is associated with problems now napping is the same thing what so so to answer all his questions so the first question about you know he's dreaming a lot so dreaming in it, in fact dreaming would suggest that you are you are hitting rem sleep you are hitting the deep deep part of sleep which is a which is good uh, so the so the dreaming in itself is definitely not causing a problem with your sleep the dreaming is a good sign now what might be happening is that you wake up in the middle of the dream because you're not getting enough quantum of sleep so that rem sleep is getting interrupted and that that leaves you feeling irritable that's a possibility the other possibility is if you're sleeping during the afternoon you're not you're just not hitting enough rems at night uh, and that's that's causing a a problem in the quality what i would strongly recommend a person like this is to to try and completely abolish the afternoon nap <clears throat> and doing that just doing that in itself uh, will probably consolidate the sleep better at night thank you we have a question from uh, mulidhar khattar who says if you have urine incontinence requiring you to get up in the night three or four times in the night uh, how do you manage this interruption in the sleep so i'm 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 presuming that the person is wearing a diaper because i think an adult diaper is a good idea you know if uh, if you can make peace with the fact that getting out of bed is going to be disruptive and if you can you can make peace with the fact that the incontinence with a diaper works better uh, i think i think that's a solution uh, if something can be done medically to to sort out the incontinence i guess that would be a great idea as well uh, but but there's no there's no easy fix to a to a to a problem like this what what i would strongly suggest is try and see if something can be done for the incontinence if not try and see uh, whether you can make peace with wearing a diaper so that you know your sleep isn't interrupted thank you uh, there's a question from kt dadanchi who says doctor we were advised that we should not drink more water after 8 pm or we will not have sound sleep as we seniors keep getting up to urinate thereby having a disturbed sleep every day what is your advice i think that's that's not uh, unreasonable provided that you are not waking up due to thirst you know some people have a very dry mouth in the night and and they wake up because they are so thirsty uh, but i but I, i don't see why that's i mean that's very reasonable advice that's very sensible common sense advice you are not going to get dehydrated overnight nothing bad is going to happen uh, if you don't have uh, fluids from 8 in the night to the next morning but if it if it kind of reduces your frequency of passing urine i think that's good advice also there are two questions on snoring uh, uh, one uh, from bhakti pitare who says my husband is 64 perfectly healthy condition but he has a snoring problem he snores very loudly how do you get the snoring stopped any medication treatment that can be given to him there's another uh, uh, question uh, from a person he says i am a senior citizen but my son who is just 23 snores a lot i don't want him to get into a similar problem of sleep apnea in future what should i do at this stage so i think the the solution to both of them is to have a sleep study so the, to the first uh, individual snoring in itself does not does not need to be treated of course i mean it needs to be treated so that the spouse has a better better sleep but about 40% of the population snores out of whom you know if you take the entire pool so 100 individuals 40 snore only about 10 5 to 10 have sleep apnea so 30 of them snore but do not necessarily need to be treated so the question is during those episodes of snoring is the person's oxygen level falling down or is the person waking up at a subconscious level and, and that's what a sleep study essentially detects so if the person's otherwise healthy and you know we do a sleep study and the sleep study just demonstrates snoring and nothing else then again you know we can look at options such as forcing the person to sleep on their side trying to see if there are associations with uh, alcohol for example there are some other associations that are triggering off the the snoring um and that's that's a simple solution for this for the for the second individual who has a son who is 23 24 that's not an uncommon age at which to to develop sleep apnea especially if the person is overweight is on the heavier side and that's a great age at which you should try and fix it in the sense that uh, you know so what happens as a consequence is if you're 23 you're overweight you have sleep apnea quality of sleep is bad you're sleepy during the day because you're so sleepy during the day you don't feel uh, motivated enough either to exercise 
or to lose weight in any other form and that's again a cycle that keeps on playing so by breaking that cycle by putting the person on the right treatment improving the quality of sleep the person likely to get more energetic and and be more motivated to lose weight and hopefully with time maybe maybe reduce the severity of that sleep apnea so again the solution the starting point would be to do a sleep study is what i would suggest thank you uh, there's another question uh, from someone who says that uh, i have been advised an app called headspace which gives better sleep and there are a few others also like calm etc are these right. worthwhile do these work so meditation is a great idea for anybody i mean there's more and more evidence which suggests that meditation helps in a lot of different parameters uh it will not help with sleep apnea uh, but it will help it, it there's a good chance that it might help you with uh, with insomnia and sleep you know difficulty falling asleep people people tend to be very wired people tend to be very um thinking about things all the time and meditating calms you down you know so any form of meditation makes you more thoughtful makes you more mindful of things uh and and i don't see i mean there, there's a total scientific plausibility to why that might improve sleep so i i don't see anything wrong in trying these methods uh if insomnia is what you suffer from so uh the the second question and because i i guess uh, this person has heard your answer is that does this make you addicted to the sleep app so that you don't get sleep you know without it no i mean again the the apps that you mentioned from what you know you're talking about mind space or head space head space is a meditation app which does not necessarily have to be done while you are sleeping you do it at some point of time in the day is what i understand uh similar to calm there are there are certain apps which play music at night you know which which have soothing music and there is there is one which was developed for astronauts in nasa as well uh because when you're out in space you don't have that day night uh, thing sorted out the the circadian rhythm now those apps i don't i don't see a reason why anybody would get addicted to anything but uh, on the other hand you know if it's if it's a habit that helps you in some way i i don't see any any huge flip side to it i don't see any negative side to it uh doctor there's a question from mr navin chandra shetty uh, who's thanking you for your uh, useful insights he says uh, what is the minimum hours of sleep for an active person of about 70 years of age so i think we should stick to 8 8 is the minimum number of hours that everybody should aspire to and it's a myth that as you grow older your your quantum the requirement of sleep comes down the pattern of sleep changes but the requirement is still about 8 hours Uh, this is a question from from an anonymous attendee who says i'm 78 years old i have had urinary con- incontinence problem in the past but after having been treated for bladder carcinoma it has greatly improved but i need to go to the washroom at least twice uh, but thereafter i fall off to sleep immediately my night sleep i sleep time is about 6 hours and afternoon nap with disruption is for an hour is this okay so one of the questions one needs to ask oneself is are you sleepy otherwise are you happy with the way your life is otherwise so are you reasonably sharp are you reasonably are you having memory lapses are you in a fog sometimes you feel that you're not you don't have the clarity uh, that you would desire in which case there's clearly something that's going on which is wrong if this pattern seems to have worked well and you're you quite sharp you're quite happy in the hours that you're awake and you don't have any other major medical issues which are worsening so if you have high blood pressure which is getting worse with time then of course there's a problem so then i would recommend that you switch over and try try to make those 6 hours at night 8 hours and try and come down on the on the afternoon nap uh if something's working great again i i would there's no strong reason to disrupt it but very often in 9 out of 10 10 people in a situation that this individual is uh things usually aren't that great you know because this 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 is not a physiological pattern to sleep for 2 hours in the afternoon and to sleep sleep for 6 hours at night uh we have a question from colonel bg dukal uh who says my wife is 72 she's been having a sleep problem since we got married in 1969 she's diabetic and had a stroke 6 years back she's under treatment of a neurologist this has affected her health how do we go about a treatment plan no i mean so if you're talking about sleep problems since 1969 in terms of you know there are some individuals who will tell you for the past 40 years i've slept at 3 in the morning and i've woken up at 10 in the night those problems are are extremely difficult to fix if they if they if they've been going on for a long time because it's essentially your body's circadian rhythm your body clock 
has been completely disrupted and and you know the longer the period uh, that that's been the case the more challenging is it it is to fix and it involves things like you know bright light stimulation trying to confuse the brain trying to reset that that clock uh, and and asking yourself whether it really needs to be done you know if somebody is adapted to that kind of a life uh, do you really need to change it now after a stroke there could be a lot of disruptions which are related to the fact that areas of the brain aren't perfused adequately uh, and that's that's a very specific question which will have to be dealt with you know knowing what the stroke is like and what are exactly the consequences of that stroke of, of that stroke strokes are also commonly associated with sleep apnea so the strongest association of disease with sleep apnea is high blood pressure and stroke so if the stroke was potentially a consequence of that sleep apnea you could possibly prevent the next stroke by by getting treatment for sleep apnea quite a few questions have come in doctor and i don't know whether we'll have the time to respond to all but let me uh, rush through a few of them sure. uh, there's one question from pulsum manavati who uh, asked are sedatives harming the body do they harm the body absolutely i mean i have no doubt in my head that sedatives are are over 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 prescribed you know and so in my sleep practice it's probably less than 1% of individuals who are on sedatives uh 99% of people who have sleep problems this the the sleep problem is a symptom it's not the disease you need to figure out what's triggering that sleep problem rather than just writing a prescription of a sedative which is very easy to do the older you get the more dangerous are sedatives because they have spillover effects during the course of the day so you know the probability of you slipping and falling the probability of you making a mistake while while driving your car all of those increase as you get older because the body takes a longer time to metabolize the sedatives there are some which are better than the better than others uh, but by and large you know you the sedative should be a mode of of it should be your last resort after you've tried out everything after you've tried to figure out in a very small proportion of individual uh, individuals after doing all of that when you really can't figure it out sometimes you do need to add a sedative Hey doctor, there's a question about driving and sleeping. Is every time I go on the expressway, the Mumbai Pune expressway, I feel sleepy. Why does so, it happen? So this is a very common problem, and uh, in the US, uh, if you've driven in the US on the shoulders, they have these small rumblers which are there. So individuals who sleep very often. fall fall asleep at the wheel of you drowsy and and go towards the rumblers and those rumblers are actually meant they were designed to actually wake you up because so many people would stray off uh so you fall asleep because it's monotonous because uh, you know there are there are highways in the world where even if even when they could build a straight road from point a to point b they make a lot of winding along the way so that people don't fall asleep so this is a very common problem what i would suggest you do is have some caffeine before have a have a cup of coffee before you start driving or uh, do something you know ask somebody frequently ask you questions or do you know have a conversation with somebody uh listen to some music maybe you know whatever it is that that will keep you uh stimulated when it's it, when the job is very monotonous it's basically a reflection of the job being monotonous all you have to do is go in a straight path and and that that causes sleepiness in any in anybody that being said again the sleepiness is still a reflection of the fact that you are a sleepy individual that you haven't received an adequate quantum of sleep which is why this is triggering off that sleepiness an individual who slept enough no matter how mundane the task he will not fall asleep so you still need to question yourself you know have i slept adequately the previous night do i have sleep apnea what is wrong with the quality of my sleep that is making me feel sleepy uh, while driving on the expressway so we have a question from rb who says my mom who's 80 plus wakes up at night and eats a biscuit she's been doing this for years any suggestions i mean if she's been doing it for years i i don't think you should mess with that in the sense that if it gives her some sort of joy i think i think you should let it be uh, unless you see that there are some ill effects or ill consequences of that biscuit eating uh i i don't see i don't i don't see any great harm you know some people do this midnight snack thing and you know if it's a recent phenomenon then it would be worth investigating seeing that if her blood sugar's fall at that point of time is you know what is what is stimulating that but if it's been happening since years it's it's just become a habit now and you know it will it will just make her unhappy if you try to break it is what i think uh thanks we have a question from gurdeep shroff who says i'm 64 years old male and an asthmatic and suffer from rhinitis on uh, budamate transcape and puramist nasal spray 
and dreams of and i have dreams of fighting but no actual movement of limbs some nights i get good sleep even after using the washroom up to three times a day three times a night uh, why the disturbed sleep some days so again what i would what i would suggest is that you keep something like a sleep diary which includes everything you know mm-hmm. so just keep a chronology of what's happening during the course of the day you know so have you had dinner late on those nights in which your sleep is affected so a lot of a lot of the things that we do happen at a very subconscious level that we we can't even able we, we aren't even able to uh, kind of get the subtle nuances that may be responsible so i think just keep a diary of your entire days and nights for a good month or so so note down the days on which you felt unrefreshed note down the days in which you felt refreshed see if there's a pattern is it is it the weekend which tends to be worse is it the weekdays which tends to be worse is there a favorite program of yours which comes on television for example on a particular day which makes you sleep late that particular night and you'd be surprised at 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 the revelations that come out by keeping such a diary i think you know just maintaining a diary is the first step to trying to figure out why are some nights different from others uh, doctor there's a question from someone this is an interesting question he says i used to sleep very well earlier but since the various ott platforms have come i binge watch and i end up watching some show still very late in the night i know it's harmful but what do i do so this is this is i guess in the domain of uh, of lifestyle modification i don't claim to be an expert on that but uh, but you know you you have a problem you've identified what the problem is and therefore the solution shouldn't be that difficult to follow but uh, i mean all of us do that right at the end of the day all of us do things that we know are not necessarily in our best interest but uh, the the temptation is so strong uh, that that we fall into temptation and i guess if you do it once in a way it's okay i mean there is flexibility in life no we are not machines at the end of the day but if it's happening consistently and if it's interfering with with the quality of your life you will have to take a step back unfortunately i mean i don't see any other simple solution right uh we have a question i'll i'll, I'll ask two more questions there is a question from dibendu sure. ganguly who says i'm 60 years old and use a cpap but i have sinus allergies that block my nose often i've been using otrovin to clear my nose and i'm told that that's harmful in the long run do you recommend that i get a full mask that allows me to breathe through my mouth absolutely so i mean that's that's a problem which we sometimes face if individuals have a blocked nose and you try to get them to use cpap it's going to be challenging otrovin is not a good idea at all so you're absolutely right the reason it's not a good idea is that it causes something called rebound congestion and it causes something called tachyphylaxis so tachyphylaxis means if you use it regularly over time it stops being as effective as before uh, and then if you suddenly stop it the act of stopping the drug actually causes a rebound congestion so it makes your congestion even worse than what it was before uh, that's the reason it's not it's not a good drug there are good nasal sprays which are available if you have al- allergic rhinitis which which might help you uh but you need to speak to your doctor and see if you're the right person for those nasal sprays in the meantime if your nose is blocked and you're trying to force air to it it's it's going to be uncomfortable so yes you know try and switch to a full face mask it might be more comfortable uh, doctor this person who had asked a question earlier about uh, his father being diagnosed with grade 1 uh, mild obstructive sleep apnea he says uh, and who had also sent the report he says he is his father is a cardiac patient and snores a lot um right so if you're a cardiac patient you snore a lot and your sleep apnea your sleep study showed mild osa i would take that with a grain of salt in the sense that i would definitely probe more into knowing whether the person slept well during the night of the study you know i would want to be absolutely convinced that this was genuine if the study i think from the study it looks like it was done in a lab you might want to do a home study and see you know have another study where your father slept in the comforts of his home with potentially a better quality of sleep in terms of deeper sleep and see if the sleep apnea actually looks a lot worse than what it was in the first night uh um, so if somebody who has cardiac illness i my threshold for treating would be a lot lower than somebody who had no problems and maybe even for the mildest of sleep apneas the fact that he's snoring as well goes in line uh, i would prescribe cpap uh doctor we have a, we have a question from geeta sokshi and a few others as to how do you uh, how can one consult you and do you do teleconsults yes i do so i work at hinduja mahim and hinduja khar um, and both uh, you know from the websites there are numbers for teleconsults etc and, and you can contact me through either sites great thanks a lot uh, dr pinto for, for your time and for this excellent presentation 
and we'll see you next Saturday. Thank you. Bye.